Hannibal has a global vision. He realizes that Rome is on the rise and that if Rome is not stopped, that it means not only the end of Carthage, but it also means the end of the various barbarian tribes. He also recognizes that the only way that Rome can be stopped is with the assistance of these allies. At that point, Hannibal knew what he would have done, invade Italy. To do that, he needed a big, big army. Carthaginians were not enough. He had to recruit the barbarian communities of southern and central Spain. It's a difficult task. It's a very diverse army, and Hannibal has to get them to work together. He was promising them loot. We're out for adventure and wealth. Let's go, guys. Hannibal's plan to attack the Romans is both audacious, visionary, and extremely risky. He plans to march about a 1,000 miles overland and to cross the Alps. He feels that whatever the cost, the advantage in shocking the Romans with him turning up in Italy will make it all worthwhile. Strange enough, he started the enterprise in the fall. He didn't wait for spring, so he got ready to cross the Alps in the worst conditions possible. It's apparently insane. He's dealing with an environment such as he's never faced before. It's winter in all its fury. It's ice, it's snow, it's wind, it's frostbite. It's just terrible. It looked like he had led his army into unmitigated disaster. Order was breaking apart, food was scarce, dogs were eating soldiers. It's indescribable. Despite all the disasters of the Alps, he keeps his eye on the ball. He understands once he can get to Italy, he can rebuild everything and it'll be a whole new war, a whole new ball game. So that's why he's able to get through the situation in the Alps. The outcome of the passing makes some of Hannibal's priorities very pressing. He has to fight the Romans immediately and score several big victories. And this is what he does. The Romans put forth their best legions in front of Hannibal's army, and they can't stop him. One after the other, he brings them to destruction. And this builds a momentum all its own. Romans at Cannae put together an enormously large army. They've got about 80,000 men on the battlefield. And they vastly outnumber Hannibal's. They've got about 50,000 men. How is he going to defeat the Romans? And the answer is he wants the Romans to come into a trap. And partly because Hannibal set his trap well, and partly because the Romans are overconfident, they fall completely into the trap. It's a paradigmatic example of how you defeat the Romans. You ambush them. And Canae is the greatest ambush in ancient history. Hannibal's plan for the Battle of Canae is absolutely brilliant. 70,000 Roman troops fall in a single day. Oh, short pan there from the History Channel. Of course, on the background of Hannibal, of course, one of the most famous generals of the Carthaginians uh, in the Punic War. So, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope everybody's having a great week out there. Uh, of course, you know, just getting ready to start spring break in a few days. Uh, of course, I'll be wrapping up this uh, lecture on the, the kind of early history of the Roman period, like Roman Republic. So we'll talk about that uh, down to about the death of Julius Caesar. So, hey, welcome you back. Uh, looks like I do have a few students watching live right now. I guess we'll have some other students uh, that'll join us later in the live stream. But uh, Amanda, hey, what's going on, Amanda? Good morning. Um, also, it looks like Tristan's also joining us uh, as well. And also, uh, yeah, Tristan and of course, Christian uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, spring break, uh, only a few days away. I think uh, Friday, April 7th, of course, is you know the date when spring break starts, I know, uh, for our college. Uh, we'll, I think we'll commence back, of course, with class again on Monday, April the 17th. So if you got plans in spring break, maybe taking – I'm taking a trip somewhere, too, myself. Um, but uh, anyway um, – Kind of talk about a few things, a little reminders before I get started today of uh, this lecture. But uh, I know uh, we have two main assignments out right now. Uh, second exam, of course, on those uh, lectures on the uh, uh, China, China lectures and 
also on ancient Greece, uh, and then also a second exam bonus quiz on the Alex Alexander the Great lecture I did a while back. Uh, so I know those are our two main assignments out right now. Uh, I know after we come back from spring break, there's going to be, of course, another assignment due, uh, which will be that third vocabulary. I'll kind of talk about that later. But I probably will keep some of these assignments open you know, during the spring break because uh, I know we'll be out for a while uh, and all that. So anyway, uh, just kind of talking about some assignments that are out there uh, that we have, but not too many assignments left, I think. I think this lecture I'm doing today is going to be part of a one of our last Canvas quizzes, and then I think after that we've got mostly just final exams coming up later. So anyway, like I said, today I'm going to continue talking about the Roman world. I'm going to, of course, get into mostly the late Republic, We'll talk about, we'll kind of talk about from the Punic Wars down to the death of Julius Caesar, because, you know, his assassination, they think, is really what uh, caused the end of the traditional republic. So we'll get into that, because uh, after spring break, I'll kind of start talking about the Roman Empire uh, itself. Uh, so if you have any, you know, comments, questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, in the live stream, do let me know, or you can always leave comments uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, also, don't forget, students can also leave comments uh, in discussions as well uh, in, you know, Canvas online. So anyway, like I said, uh, we were uh, talking about before, I was kind of just getting into the Punic Wars uh, in my last lecture, uh, and... Um, I think we talked about the background of the Punic Wars and the Carthaginian Empire. And then I think we talked a little bit about the first Punic War, which was not as famous uh, as probably the other two that come later. We'll talk about the second Punic War, of course, today first. And then I'll get into what happens to Carthage. Then we'll talk about how the Republic starts to become more like an empire uh, with all this expansion and conquest uh, that's kind of going on. So, yeah, we have Hannibal. We were talking about Hannibal, uh, Barca, the Barsid family, of course, uh, based in Spain. Uh, of course, they launch, uh, like I said, invasion into Italy uh, in 218 B.C. Uh, Hannibal sparked the Second Punic War over Spain. Spain is like one of the main conflicts that really led to this war, which I told you, Second Punic War was really the bloodiest of the three Punic Wars total. More people probably killed in that one than, than the other ones combined. Uh, and um, I think they say it was kind of a conflict over the territory because the Carthaginians believed that that was that area was their, theirs to kind of colonize and control. Uh, but the Romans had allies there. Like there was one city called Saguntum on the east coast of Spain uh, that was mostly a pro-Greek, pro was a Greek state that was kind of pro-Roman. And... Um, and so I think Hannibal sacked that city, and then he decided to invade Italy uh, at that point. So I told you he had massed this huge army, you saw, that marches through the Alps, which you know ends up you know shocking uh, the Romans. So yeah, I think I've got a map showing you uh, the kind of the route that Hannibal takes from Spain uh, through the Pyrenees into like where now southern France is, and then you can see he marched through uh, the northern part of Italy and through the Alps, crossing through the mountains uh, with maybe an army that may have been close to like 100,000 men uh, at that point. And uh, he attacked into northern Italy. And if you know about a lot of the early battles, the Romans were, their forces were almost obliterated uh, by Hannibal and his tactics. Uh, battle of, um, I think they have Battle of Trebia in 218 and then Battle of Lake Trasimene was another battle in 217 uh, where the Roman forces were uh, badly beaten uh, in both those battles. Uh, there was this Roman um, general, by the way, I'll kind of mention, he's also a Roman consul. His name was Fabius. Uh, and Fabius um, wanted to use guerrilla tactics to fight against Hannibal. Uh, and... Um, They thought he was a coward. They, they wanted to, you know, you know, attack Hannibal's forces, you know, you know, mano, mano a mano, I guess, uh, you know, with a full army. Uh, and so they thought he was trying to delay the inevitable, you know, fighting Hannibal. They later find out that this guy, Fabius, you know, he was right. His policies actually end up as part of why they win the wars later, of course, with the second one. 
Uh, and uh, and so um, they they amassed this huge army, which of course we'll get to the Battle of Can Cani, of course, that's real famous, of course, which happens in August of 216 BC. Uh, the Romans bring up an army of something like 90,000 or almost 90,000 troops uh, to try to trap Hannibal in the southern part of Italy. I've got some images, by the way, showing the actual battlefield of of what is uh, Cani, which Cani is this like little small little uh, village in southern Italy uh, where the actual battle would take place uh, between the two sides. It's kind of debated about the saying of the name. Can I? I've heard also can E, I think pronounced also that way uh, as well. Uh, I've got kind of a, a map showing you like the battle of the two different forces that were really involved. Hannibal only had about 40,000 troops. It's pretty amazing. I think he was outnumbered like basically two to one uh, in the battle. However, uh, if you look at that map of the battle, um, Hannibal actually put his forces in kind of a V formation, which was really a trap. It was when the Romans attacked with their inf infantry, their legions in the center, Hannibal basically formed this kind of envelopment of their forces where he drove off their cavalry off the battlefield. So I think at the beginning of the war, the Carthaginians had a more superior cavalry uh, than the Romans did. And what ends up happening, Hannibal encircles this huge army, like bigger than his, like 80, 90,000 troops, like I'm telling you. And they had three generals. It was such a large army. And out of the three generals, uh, two of them were killed, including one of the main ones, which was uh, Lucius Aemilius Paulus. Uh, he was killed in the battle. And um, I think about 70,000 of the actual, 80, 90,000 of the actual Roman forces uh, were either killed or captured in the battle. I want to say at least 50,000 may have been killed in the battle. That's how awful the battle was. And so I think they consider the Battle of Cannae to be one of the first major uh, encirclement battles. It's kind of like a double envelopment, uh, but more like an encirclement where an army encircles another army. You see a lot more in modern times, like like World War II, and where they encircle cities and armies and things like that. Uh, Hannibal was like one of the first to really do that uh, in warfare, at least in ancient times. So yeah, that battle, um, you know, really changed the war. It could have anyway. Uh, in the end, from there, he could have marched on Rome. Uh, they believe. Uh, which uh, I think I've got a map. I don't know if I have a map showing it here. But here's the depth of Paulus. Like I said, he would get killed uh, in in the battle. Uh, but um, they think that Hannibal wasn't really able to take uh, Rome because, you know, Rome, remember, it's fortified. You have the so-called Servian Wall uh, that kind of, you know, protects it uh, around, around its main city. They don't think he had enough forces or siege equipment. And so the only thing that Hannibal really could do uh, was march around and control part of the actual Italian countryside, which I think he mostly took the southern part of Italy, which he controlled. Uh, I think the largest city he actually captured was the city of Capua, which is located south, south of Rome. Uh, and so the Romans at that point had to, they had to change strategies. Uh, they couldn't, you know, fight Hannibal you know, mano a mano, like I was kind of talking about. And so uh, this general came in, Scipio Africanus. They kind of see him as one of the greatest generals, really, uh, in the Second War, uh, which you see right here. Scipio, of course, prepare for war since you have been unable to endure a peace, kind of a quote from him. Uh, really, uh, Scipio was re really using the tactics of Fabius Maximus, uh, the so-called delayer, uh, as as the Romans uh, called him. And so Scipio, what he would do, he would launch attacks uh, into other parts of the Carthaginian world. Now, the idea was to basically target Carthage's supply lines, uh, which were coming from Spain, uh, you see. And so you can see uh, the Roman forces then pushed westward <clears throat> into uh, like the southern part of France and into what would be now uh, Spain today. And so that took a matter of like something like three or four years for the Romans to do that. 
And uh, eventually they would seize they would seize Spain by about two, 206 BC uh, through several battles uh, you can see there. So I think initially they thought that that would actually force Hannibal to leave Italy. You know, go back to, I guess, Spain or go back to maybe North Africa, but he didn't do that at that point. Uh, and so the other thing that Scipio also did, if you know, he launched an attack into then North Africa is the next thing they did as well. I think this image, uh, this map here kind of shows you <clears throat> what they would do. Uh, think around, I want to say 203 BC, I believe is it. Uh, the Romans launched an attack from Sicily uh, into uh, North Africa, which will be really the pivotal event, really, that ends the war at that that point, by the way. Uh, Scipio, by the way, uh, is considered to be one of, really, Rome's greatest generals. I think up there with Gaius Marius uh, and Julius Caesar. So he's really considered a great general uh, overall. African is more like a title they gave him later because uh, he conquered uh, part of Africa or defeated the you know, Carthaginians in Africa. I think his first name was actually Cornelius, Cornelius Scipio. They later gave him the title Africanus. Uh, and um, I think sometimes he was called the Roman Hannibal because people kind of viewed him as being kind of equal to Hannibal in success militarily. So that's what happens. You get this deal where Hannibal and Scipio face off against each other uh, in battle because uh, Hannibal at that point is forced to return uh, to uh, North Africa in 202 BC. And that'll lead to a famous battle between those two famous geniuses. You got the so-called Battle of, of Zama, it's called, uh, which takes place in North Africa. I think the date of it was happened in about October uh, October 202 BC, October 19th, maybe when it may have happened. And it's fought in now what we call modern Tunisia today. I think I think the actual battle site is kind of located maybe southwest of uh, the city of Tunis now uh, in Tunisia. And the battle's famous for several things. It's kind of well known. I'll kind of talk about, but there's a deal where supposedly the two generals met each other before the battle. As so I think um, Hannibal was curious about Scipio. And then I think Scipio thought that Hannibal ought to surrender because he thought the war was over. I think the Romans had more forces in Carthage now than the Carthaginians had. Uh, and so there was a deal where the two actually met each other uh, and Hannibal refused to surrender his forces. So they ended up fighting the battle uh, and all that. And uh, of course, what ended up happening, if you know about it, was Scipio's forces would rout Hannibal like badly beat his forces. And a lot of what played a major role in it was cavalry. The Romans uh, had better cavalry by that time. Uh, you can see their cavalry size, too, in that image right there. Uh, 9,000 cavalry, which I think there was a deal where some of the cavalry of Hannibal, which I think were Numidians, switched to uh, the Roman side. Uh, and so he was outnumbered. And then Hannibal tried to use uh, war elephants, in the battle against the Romans, but they proved to be obsolete because that's one thing you see later uh, after the Battle of Zama. Basically, ele elephants aren't used much in warfare in the West anymore. They become totally obsolete. Uh, but most of uh, Hannibal's forces uh, was either captured uh, or killed or wounded in the battle. So totally, totally, his forces got totally wiped out uh, after that. And so that was pretty much the end of the war. Uh, for the Carthaginians. Uh, the Romans didn't really conquer that area or uh, destroy Carthage. They, of course, do that later uh, in the Third Punic War. But Carthage had to pay actually heavy war reparations for you know damages that were done uh, to Italy and the Romans. So I think they paid like around 50 years it took them to pay it back. Also, that area of Spain I told you about, the Romans basically seized it and took it after the war. And so the Carthage ends up with very little territory afterwards. And then Hannibal is forced into exile is something that does happen uh, after the war. And you actually flee to uh, the east, uh, where he actually fought for the Seleucid Empire, uh, believe it or not, against the Romans, because the Romans are conquering eastward as they're conquering Carthage uh, as well. In fact, this map kind of shows you uh, kind of the result 
for the second Peter Corps. Uh, but uh, that area, that purple on the bottom, uh, Numidia, which is kind of to the west of Carthage, actually got control of that area right there. And so Carthage had very little territory left. It's basically where Tunisia is today. It's all they have left. And you can see the Romans are expanding, take over Spain, and then also take over Greece and Macedonia as well. So it's slowly starting to be a larger state that's going to become an empire eventually. Now, they do have, of course, the Third Punic War, which this war was more decisive uh, that they would have uh, in the end. The Third Punic War, if you know much about it, the Romans are going to eventually destroy Carthage. It's going to be totally obliterated uh, in this war. Uh, the actual years of it are from 149 to 146 BC, and they think the reason why the war broke out was different reasons. One was um, the fact that the Romans feared that Carthage might come back again, like they did with the Second War, because there was kind of a resurgence with Hannibal uh, in the Second War. So the Romans, I think, saw this Third War as like a preemptive type war to prevent them from maybe attacking Rome uh, again. Also, the, uh, some of the Romans, especially the wealthy people, wanted to take over North Africa, like take it and colonize it, all the land. Uh, so they saw that as an opportunity. And uh, what caused them to actually do it, if you know about this, uh, is the fact that uh, Carthage wanted to go to war with Numidia. And so Numidia was kind of like an ally of Rome. And so they used it as a pretext to attack Carthage, uh, which they did. <clears throat> Oh, and by the way, kind of show this image right here. Um, the Roman Senate was part of the reason for it. They, they were the ones pretty much that favored the war because a lot of the wealthy patricians, they saw this as an opportunity to seize the land that was, of course, uh, in, in North Africa. And uh, there was this famous um, Roman senator named Marcus Cato. He's well known uh, during this war, the Third Punic War, as being a major supporter of, uh, of, of, the, third, of the Third War. And um, he was very famous for this quote he was known for in the Third Punic War, which was, Carthage must be destroyed, uh, which he would make in various speeches uh, in the Roman Senate. And so he's like one of these several war hawks that was basically uh, involved in supporting the war. You want the Latin, of course, which is Carthage Delinda S. Uh, and a little poetry there, right? Uh, Rose are red, the legions deployed, Carthage must be destroyed. <laughs> but anyway, but um, yeah, so they would launch this attack into Carthage at that point. And so uh, easily the Romans took most of the territory uh, around Carthage except for the actual city. The city itself barricaded itself uh, inside Carthage. And so the Romans had to basically lay waste to it. They attacked the city and pretty much attacked it house by house, going through uh, the whole thing. And uh, there was a general that did sack the city. His name was uh, Scipio Aemilianus. He's the main general that's really responsible for the sacking of Carthage, which I think happened in the spring of 146 B.C. Uh, and as they took each part of Carthage, they burned it uh, as they went, uh, the Romans uh, and um, yeah, other images kind of showing here of Carthage, of course, being attacked uh, by, of course, the, by the Romans. It's kind of like Troy, you know, Troy being destroyed, uh, if you remember correctly, uh, in like the story of the Iliad and Homer. And uh, not much left of it. Like we go to uh, where, uh, you know, Tunis, where Tunis is, that's where the ruins of, of now uh, Carthage is today. Uh, there's not much left of it except burned out buildings that are now there. And uh, according to like authors like Polybius, I think who's one of the main historians on the Third Punic War, uh, the city had like maybe five, 600,000 people and like 90% of the population was actually killed uh, in the actual uh, sack of Carthage in 146. I think only 50,000 people uh, actually survived and most of them were actually enslaved, uh, they think afterwards. So not much left of it. Here's other images uh, kind of showing you, of course, the ruins of Carthage. Of course, there's a uh, modern Tunis, of course, in the background uh, right there. 
Here's other images, of course, right here. But here's an aerial view to kind of give you an idea uh, of what's left of it. So, yeah, most of it was like totally destroyed uh, afterwards. And uh, there's a legend you may have heard of that uh, the Romans uh, took salt. And they sowed, sowed salt over the place <clears throat> so that nothing would grow, grow there. They think that's a kind of a myth about Carthage that may have been <clears throat> more related to like modern times. And so uh, I want to say maybe 19th century, I think historians start talking about that idea or something like that. But that's never been proven that actually happened because uh, after after Carthage was destroyed, the Romans rebuilt a new Carthage nearby, uh, which is now where Tunis is now, Tunis, Tunisia. So, yeah, not much left of it. So totally wiped out in their culture. And so uh, that's one thing about about war, the spoils of war, whoever wins writes the history of it. And so that's why all the different writers that write about pretty much the Punic Wars are all Roman or pro-Roman. Uh, here's kind of a map showing you, but basically after the Punic Wars, you know, end, you can see that's all the territory that uh, the Romans have uh, control of. Uh, and so, yeah, they got most of like the southern part of Europe, Spain, southern France, Italy, Greece, Macedonia. They're even getting into part of western Turkey and starting to take over North Africa uh, at that point. And uh, the Romans, uh, the, the Republic at that time, which is, you know, becoming an empire, uh, they start calling the Mediterranean Sea. They kept give it nicknames like Mare Nostrum, which means our sea, or another nickname is uh, Mare Internum, which means internal sea uh, as well. And so I think they joke later that's kind of like a Roman lake because uh, the fact that for many centuries the Romans control uh, the area around the Mediterranean Sea where their navies dominate, I think up to like the 4th, 5th century CE. Uh, the Romans have some kind of control uh, over that whole region. <clears throat> now, I'm going to get next. I'm going to talk about what happens to the Republic, because it goes through a crisis period where uh, the, the Republic uh, is eventually going to become an empire, you know, controlled by emperors. Uh, the traditional Republic will be pretty much destroyed uh, at that point. And uh, I'll kind of first talk about... <clears throat> when this happened. They think this happened sometime between the second and the first centuries BC. Uh, the traditional republic declined and it becomes this imperial state where these emperors are kind of like autocrats. They're like based like a monarch uh, that they have. And there's a lot of causes of why uh, the republic declined and became more of an empire. I'll kind of go through this right here. Uh, but um, part of it you see on the right is that obviously conquest and expansion have a lot to do with it. Uh, that's one of them right here uh, that you have. So, yeah, you've got that issue uh, as well that we've talked about. Uh, also, failure of land reforms, which is something they tried to do after the Punic Wars. That failed uh, too as well. Uh, the rise of slavery, something you see uh, throughout the Roman Empire, where they formed these huge plantations uh, throughout the Roman world, uh, which were mostly controlled by the wealthy. Uh, then you've got the rise of all these Roman dictators that take over Rome uh, as well, like, you know, Julius Caesar, uh, Gaius Marius, Cornelius Sola, Octavian, Mark Antony, uh, etc. And uh, it actually leads to uh, several civil wars. And civil wars in the end is one of the things that kind of destroy the traditional republic then you've got the rise of the Roman armies, uh, which become more and more powerful uh, in the Roman world that practically control everything politically, even the emperors uh, later. So, yeah, there's your kind of that map again, of course, showing the expansion of it, which a lot of it had to do with the Roman armies that are starting to form and become bigger and bigger and more stronger. Uh, and uh, I wanted to talk about some reforms that they did have that they tried, of course, in the Roman world at that time, which was more like late second century. There was this deal where the Gracchi brothers came in, uh, who were actually plebes, uh, who tried to make reforms. And um, the, Gracchi, the Gracchi brothers are called Tiberius and Gaius. Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, these are called. And uh, they would actually attempt 
land reforms and what they thought that should happen after the Punic Wars is that all the land should be given to like the lower classes, like the plebes, and also the veterans that fought in the war, like the wars themselves. Well, they thought they should be rewarded for that and all that. Uh, however, what happened was the patricians uh, would oppose that. They didn't want that to happen. Uh, and so uh, both of them eventually, if you know that, were pretty much practically killed off or they were forced to commit suicide. Uh, and so that's not what happened. Uh, so what ends up happening is that the wealthy you know, patricians would concentrate all the land uh, into huge plantations that were called latifundia, that's what they called them. Uh, and these are these huge sl uh, slave plantations where mostly they would grow like crops for export, which I think most of the crops they grew were like grain crops, like barley, wheat, and things like that. Uh, also grow like grapes to make wine, olives to make olive oil. They would do a lot of exporting with that to make a lot of money, of course, off of using slave labor, uh, which they got from a lot of these wars uh, that they're fighting in. So the farms of the Gracchi brothers you know, didn't come to fruition, uh, and so that didn't help. Uh, then you have the rise of these Roman generals and statesmen that kind of come to power that really lead to why uh, Rome becomes more like an empire later with emperors. Uh, and uh, so you get the, these these political dictators, if you want to call them, uh, that kind of rise to power. Because you have these Roman statesmen that are Roman senators, and they have their own armies. Uh, and so that, that helps to cause the collapse of the traditional republic uh, by the end of the first century B.C., that one on the right, that general on the right you're looking at, of course, uh, in Statesman, which is uh, Gaius Marius, uh, he's really considered to be one of the first that really put the Republic on that footing of decline, they believe. And um, Marius was known for a bunch of things. Uh, the big thing he was very famous for, he's like, I think if you know about him, he held the position of Roman consul the most, like seven times, which I think was a record. Uh, back then. Uh, and then um, also the other thing about Marius that's real well known, he was also famous for developing what they call the Marian reforms. And that was where he took the Roman army and they began to make it more professionalized, uh, like the traditional armies that would be later under Julius Caesar in the Roman Empire. Uh, he would actually create a lot of reforms to it. And uh, some of the things that he did, uh, which was very famous, was uh, he started to uh, change the requirements of soldiers that enter into the Roman army, and it was, became mostly the poorer peoples that they brought in. Because uh, if you know about before that, if you went back to the Punic Wars, traditionally you had to have so much wealth, uh, even maybe own some kind of land or some kind of property uh, to actually be in the military. But they basically abolish those requirements. You didn't have to own any property uh, or any wealth. Um, and so most of the people that would join would be the lower classes would go into the army. And that's kind of a bad thing, actually, because a lot of these soldiers would be more loyal to the general than to the state. Uh, so that's something you're going to see later. Also, uh, you could also get citizenship, like if you're a foreigner. Uh, and also they would give also soldiers land, too like if they join the military uh, as well. He's also known for introducing what they call the Standard Legion uh, of the Republic at the time, uh, which has about 4,800 4, men in it, roughly, soldiers or legionnaires. And uh, it's called the Cohort Legion, uh, which the Cohort Legion was a type of legion which had uh, equipped with about 480 uh, legionnaires or soldiers, uh, and there were about 10 cohorts in a legion. So 4,800 men. Uh, over time, it would expand, by the way. Uh, you get up to like the Roman Empire, it gets to like five to 6,000 uh, soldiers who are actually in a legion. And uh, don't forget, you have also men that are non-combatants that also don't fight as well. So that, that's part of why the legion was really larger than 4,800 men uh, anyway. But also don't forget, they would take a cohort of 480 men and they were divided into what they call centuries. A century is a, a basically a military unit of 80 soldiers, 80 soldiers uh, times six, 
uh, six you know centuries uh, is basically a cohort, and so uh, that was the main military unit that was part of a Roman legion that was pretty important. Uh, centurion, you may have heard of uh, before, probably mentioned the Bible, uh, is a type of Roman officer that would lead a century, basically. Uh, and so um, I guess if you do the map on it with that, there's 60 centuries uh, in a legion. So, so anyway, this is kind of about the story about uh, well, Marius. And Marius was a, like probably a, one of the best generals, they think, after uh, the Punic Wars at that time. Now, the only thing was, there, of course, there's an image of the Roman Legion. By the way, kind of show you an image of the Roman Legion uh, real quick here. But, uh, the, yeah, the Romans were heavily armed. You can see they used kind of more of a rectangular-type shield uh, to protect themselves in battle. They had more superior armor, you know, compared to, you know, like we saw with the Greek hoplite. So scale armor, later chain mail uh, also being used. Uh, they used like a heavy javelin. Uh, as a weapon as well. And then, of course, the most famous sword that the Romans used was the Roman short sword, uh, which, of course, is called a gladius. Now, of course, we have Cornelius Sola, of course, another famous uh, Roman general and statesman that will come next. He was a rival uh, to Marius, who kind of comes in uh, at that point. Uh, oh, by the way, I didn't show that part right there in the image right there. But uh, one thing about Marius I forgot to talk about that I did want to mention. I don't think that's in there about that. Uh, at the top, you see there, there it is, uh, the Aquila. Forgot about that, mentioned about that. But the so-called eagle symbol, that became basically uh, the symbol of all legions after that. So Marius and Sola, all these other generals that come later, all their legions will use that as the actual symbol of all legions, which the eagle was connected to the god Jupiter and all that. But back to basically talking about Cornelius and Sola. Sola was this younger general and statesman who challenged uh, Marius for control of Rome. Uh, and if you know about it, the two would end up eventually getting into loggerheads uh, with each other. And uh, part of the problem in Rome at the time was that they had these two different political factions that formed. You had the so-called populares on one side, and then you had the optimates. Uh, what was the difference? Uh, the populares were these uh, senators that supported mostly patrician and wealthy uh, ideas, uh, protect, you know, the wealthy people's property and things like that, support their ideas. Uh, and then the optimates, actually, I'm sorry, I got that backwards, excuse me, for some reason. Populators, excuse me, populators, excuse me, were actually the supporters of plebes. Get that backwards, I don't know why. The populators were for plebes uh, and um, and their supporters, uh, like Gaius Marius, Julius Caesar, were kind of like populators men. And then optimates, excuse me, were the senators that were more for the wealthy people. I don't know why I got that backwards for some reason. But um, so that's kind of what caused them to go to loggerheads. They also think that was part of the reason why uh, the Republic collapsed later into a traditional empire we see later, uh, because of these two sides opposing each other. Uh, and uh, so it would actually lead to a civil war where Sola declared war <clears throat> on Barry's supporters and him, and uh, it would drag on for several years, but they think that had a major role in causing the decline of the traditional public, republic because uh, several civil wars will kind of break out after that uh, because of this incident. Uh, they think one thing that Marius is very famous for, Marius would eventually, uh, we'll see the rise of Julius Caesar afterwards with him, but uh, with the optimates, uh, and the popular is at war with each other. Um, one thing that you do see that's very famous about Sola, Sola is going to revive the dictatorship uh, in Rome, which they had it before, but had only been used really in times of emergency. And so one thing that Sola was very famous for uh, is that he would march on Rome. Uh, it's one of the things that he would do and restore the actual 
uh, Roman dictatorship between about 82 to 79 BC. So they think that kind of plays a role later in why you get the rise of Julius Caesar, uh, the idea of this dictatorship uh, and all that. But the only thing about Sulla was he stepped out, was one of the things that, of course, uh, would happen. Uh, but yeah, the optimates and the populetas, you know, populetas more support of plebes, optimates in support of like patricians and the wealthy, you know, that that basically is a major conflict and later causing the downfall, of course, of the, of the Republic. Now, like I said about Julius Caesar, that's really considered to be one of the main uh, events that really leads to why uh, the traditional Republic declines uh, at that point. Uh, and um, if you know about this time after the period of, of Marius and Sulla, you get this deal where uh, they have these triumphants that come in. I'll get to the spread that forms around 60 BC. Uh, then there's another one later. We'll talk about uh, the second triumvirate that forms in 43 BC. Those two, those two things really, it's kind of the major events that really lead to why uh, the Republic, eventually the traditional Republic ends. And uh, the first triumvirate was this alliance that formed between Julius Caesar uh, Marcus Crassus and Gnaeus Pompey, uh, sometimes called Pompey Magnus, Pompey the Great, and um, kind of seen as almost like a dictatorship at this point forming uh, to control a lot of the policies uh, of Rome. Uh, and um, it was kind of an image of, of course, the three right there, Caesar, Crassus, uh, and Pompey. Uh, on the left, Caesar uh, was more of this Pro populatus man uh, who was in the Senate, he favored more of like the plebes and their causes. And uh, Caesar later is known for being a great general, but like, considered one of the greatest generals in probably Roman history up there with Scipio, Marius, and others. Uh, and so he kind of, like I said, is going to play a major role in why the traditional republic, the demise of it, will become, uh, of course. Uh, then the man in the middle, uh, which is Marcus Crassus, uh, he uh, was more of a uh, pro, um, he was more pro-optimate, uh, basically type senator. And uh, he was famous for his military exploits as well. Uh, they, Crassus actually was considered to be one of the most wealthy men uh, in Rome. I think he was kind of considered almost like a billionaire. And then Pompey on the right, Gnaeus Pompey, of course, who's also called uh, Pompey the Great. Uh, I think he's got another nickname, which is um, the Kid Butcher. I think they called him sometimes as well. He was a great general too, a uh, great statesman of Rome. Uh, and uh, I'll get to it in a second. He actually forms an alliance with, with Caesar, in, including marrying his daughter, the, the daughter of Caesar. And so uh, Gnaeus Pompey was the son-in-law of Julius Caesar. So I think I've got some images right here showing it. So yeah, you can see the first triumvirate lasted from about 60 BC uh, to 53 BC. So yeah, I got more about him right there. So Caesar, very popular, especially with the lower classes. Uh, great legal mind too, uh, Caesar. He was also a writer, wrote a few historical works uh, in the first century BC, more known for being a great Roman general in his conquests. Uh, Crassus, more known for his wealth and influence uh, in the Roman state. Yeah, he did come from the equestrian order, which I told you was kind of that upper middle class uh, type social class that was kind of, that came out of, I guess, the origin of the cavalry, maybe they think. Pompey was also had a lot of wealth uh, and also had a military reputation that was kind of equal to Caesar and Crassus uh, as well. There's Julius Caesar, uh, of course, right there uh, on the left. Uh, he's going to be known for a lot of his conquests. I'll get to the Gaelic Wars later. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, how he practically takes over the whole Republic by about 45, 44 BC as well. By the way, Caesar, uh, a little bit about him, uh, part of why he was able to rise to power uh, was because he was actually a nephew of Gaius Marius, uh, I think by marriage. And so that kind of gave him a lot of political connections uh, in Rome. But I think when Sulla took over, 
he actually had to flee Rome for a while, uh, which he did. There's Marcus Crassus right there. Now, I'll kind of talk about one thing that Marcus Crassus is famous for with Pompey. Uh, if you know about this story, uh, those two men became real popular uh, because of the Spartacus Revolt that broke out uh, around 73 B.C. Uh, 73 to 71 B.C. is about when it happened. Uh, and um, anyway, it's called different names. They sometimes call it the Third Servile War. And uh, the Spartacus Revolt was this revolt that broke out in Italy among gladiators and slaves. Uh, and it was led by this uh, this uh, gladiator, who I think I've got an image of. Well, I've got different images right here. Of course, of the Spartacus Rebellion, they call it also uh, as well. But yeah, Spartacus, of course, Kirk Douglas played, of course, the famous movie about Spartacus in 1960, which I think was a one of Stanley Kubrick's first movie he made. Uh, but they think that Spartacus was some kind of Thracian soldier who came from like where northern Greece is today, and he was being trained as a gladiator, and so he rebelled uh, against the Romans, and he formed these slave armies uh, that fought uh, against against the Romans, which he was actually successful. Actually, defeated several Roman armies uh, for a while, a uh, short short time. Uh, but uh, they do think that uh, the Spartacus Revolt, that rebellion, uh, was one of the bloodiest in, in the Roman Republic. Uh, I think I want to say something like 60,000 people uh, were probably killed on both sides combined. Uh, and uh, if you know about what happened, uh, because of mostly Crassus and Pompey, they were able to defeat Spartacus' forces. And most of the men, like what happened, like the ones that I guess survived uh, from the revolt, uh, were actually um, crucified. Uh, they were actually crucified along the Apian Way, which is a main roadway uh, that runs from Rome to where Capel is uh, down in Naples. And they were crucified along the road, uh, which they're not sure what happened to Spartacus. I think they theory, theorize that Spartacus died in battle against the Romans. Uh, I know in the movie Spartacus, uh, he basically uh, is actually crucified, but they're not sure if that really really happened or not that way. So that's kind of considered a very famous event, uh, but it made, like I said, Crassus and Pompey uh, kind of famous because uh, they finished it off. So yeah, I'll kind of get in next. The other thing that, of course, is real famous about, of course, uh, Julius Caesar is the Gaelic Wars. Uh, they think that that actual campaign is really what makes Caesar kind of famous uh, in the Roman world uh, at the time. It was a war that lasted seven or eight years uh, in Gaul, which Gaul is basically we call mostly France today and part of Belgium is where it is. Uh, but it's really considered to be one of his best conquests. He's kind of known for uh, Julius Caesar, uh, so-called Gaelic Wars. Uh, and um, kind of show an image right here, but there's basically mostly where the Romans fought of course, what we call Gaul. So uh, Caesar was given kind of control of that area uh, to try to control and conquer. Uh, and so uh, the actual wars uh, were fought against these Gaelic tribes that rebelled against the Romans. And uh, they were led by this um, Roman, Roman, uh, not Roman, uh, I think it was like a Gaelic or German type uh, general or king that was named Vercingetorix. Uh, and um, he kind of tried to organize all the tribes uh, to fight uh, against against the Romans. I think that's kind of an image of him right to B.C. is when it was. Uh, and uh, that's when they actually uh, defeated and captured Vicingetorix, who was later brought back to Rome, I think, where he was eventually killed uh, by the Romans. But they do think that the conflict itself was pretty bloody. Like Between one to two million uh, were probably killed and enslaved. Uh, in the actual Gaelic Wars. And so it's part of why Caesar becomes so famous and um, so wealthy uh, afterwards uh, because of that actual conquest right there. So there's been just Vicentorex statue of him on the right. Uh, if we go back to that map right there, uh, another thing that Caesar did that's really famous, uh, he also invaded into um, what is Germany. Uh, they think uh, between about maybe what would be I want to say, yeah, I've got 55 to 54 B.C. 
Uh, he would actually invade uh, into uh, Britain, and then he also invaded into Germany. So he did both these uh, events uh, that's kind of famous, uh, where Koblenz is, which is up on the Rhine River, uh, now in western Germany. There's actually this deal where he actually built a bridge. That's, well, actually, it might have been built two bridges at one point uh, across the actual Rhine River. But he actually crosses uh, with his forces uh, into Germany when after some of the different Gauls that went into Germany uh, and all that. So he went there and did that. Uh, and then, of course, he also invaded into Britain twice also as well. So that's pretty amazing. You know, Caesar was one of the first to actually uh, Roman to go into Germany and also to also attack into Britain. But um, the Romans were never successful in conquering uh, that area of Germany, or what they call it, Germania is what they called it. But later the Romans will conquer most of Britain, uh, except for the northern part of Scotland. Uh, now, the other thing that happened too, uh, I'll kind of get into this next, what, that the actual triumvirate would break up. Oh, by the way, I didn't kind of mention this, kind of go back and I forgot to talk about this image. If you go back to what I was talking about, yeah, Caesar also wrote about the wars. By the way, I forgot to talk about that. Uh, the series of books he wrote, uh, which are called the Commentaries on the Gaelic Wars, which were written in eight books. It's kind of like a firsthand account of the actual campaigns, which I think he wrote book by book, which he published in Rome, uh, each one. I guess, over each season, and it made him real popular in Rome because we were reading about his conquests and all that, and so kind of written in a third person, too, uh, by Caesar. And uh, so, yeah, Caesar was kind of this writer who wrote some histories, uh, like about the Gaelic Wars, and he has another book called The Civil War, uh, which is about his war uh, with his son-in-law, Pompey, uh, which they think helps in the, you know, the, uh, the actual traditional republic, but um, they're not sure if he wrote it or not. I think it's a theory that the second book, The Civil War, uh, was maybe ghostwritten by somebody, but they're not sure about that. So, yeah, that's the next thing, like I said, uh, that'll happen, of course, is that Caesar and Pompey are going to eventually fight it out uh, for, of course, control of Rome. Uh, part of what happened was in 53 BC, uh, Crassus was kind of jealous of what Caesar was doing in Gaul. And so he decided to attack the Parthian Empire. Uh, and if you know what happened, he got killed right against the Parthians. They captured him in 53 BC at the Battle of, uh, it's called Cary, I think it's called usually. And uh, he was captured and executed uh, afterwards. And so that caused the first triumvirate to collapse at that point. And so now he only had two men left, uh, Julius Caesar and Pompey that were in this original pact that they had uh, and so the two are going to come to loggerheads. Uh, by the way, a little about Pompey. I think I thought I had something on Pompey earlier. I thought I had a slide on him somewhere uh, that I had. I think he's right. That yeah, There he is right there, Pompey, uh, right there. Yeah, Pompey uh, was a famous general and statesman, too. Uh, originally a protege of Sola and Crassus uh, as well, uh, called also the great. I think there's different theories on why he's called the kid butcher, teenage butcher, butcher or something like that. But he did kill off a lot of people maybe because of the Spartacus revolt, had a bunch of people executed, things like that. Uh, but, yeah, he's the one that would form this alliance uh, with Caesar and Crassus. And I told you uh, he's the one that married Julius Caesar's only, only child, really, they had, of course, which is his daughter, Julia. Uh, and so, like I said, Gnaeus Pompey, sometimes called Pompey the Great, uh, was basically the, the son-in-law of Julius Caesar. So, yeah, let me get into, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, what happens, of course, uh, with these two men. Uh, so um, one of the things that happens is that, you know, if I remember correctly, we were talking about the populares uh, in the optimates. Caesar, like I told you, was a populares man uh, that supported more of uh, the plebes. Pompey was, too. Originally, I think he kind of supported the, you know, the plebes and all that and their causes. But apparently what happened was Pompey decided to switch uh, to more of the senatorial side uh, of the optimates. And so he kind of uh, supported them against Caesar. And so you end up with this deal where uh, the two fight for control 
uh, of, of the Republic, the so-called, they call it Caesar's Civil War, I think is usually what they nickname it. It's got different names, but my bill kind of views this as the second major civil war uh, that breaks out uh, in the second century. And they do think it's one of the major reasons for why the traditional Republic will eventually uh, decline and be replaced by the empire because uh, of the aftermaths that happen uh, after that particular conflict. Now, if you know the story about this, Caesar's still in Gaul with his forces. Uh, and so um, Caesar decides to march towards Italy because he doesn't like what Pompey's doing, of course, in Rome uh, with the Senate. And so he marches to what that river is right there. You can see, by the way, in northern Italy, which is called the Rubicon. The Rubicon, by the way, uh, was the, kind of like the border between Gaul uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, Pompey had like control of Italy with his forces. And then you had Caesar in the north, of course, in Gaul, northern Italy. Uh, and, um, and so Caesar uh, in January, they think of 49 BC, crosses the Rubicon. And they think that's the actual event that causes the outbreak of the Civil War. Caesar's famous for the quote we have heard of, which is the die is cast, or the common uh, quote, uh, in Latin, is Alea Jacta Est. Uh, of course, here's the actual quote in English, of course, uh, right there. Uh, what does he mean by that? The die is cast, or the die has been cast. It's got different translations of it. Um, basically, he means that he's gambling, uh, basically, uh, by marching into Italy uh, with his forces. And I guess he realizes if he fails, he's dead. Uh, but if he succeeds, he probably would take over Rome and be the one in, in control. Uh, and so he's gambling. Uh, and Caesar was a gambling man. He liked to play dice and things like that. And so I guess he used die as an example to show, you know, what his chances were uh, against this war against his son-in-law, Pompey. So basically, you can see that's the campaigns of Julius Caesar, uh, which, of course, uh, in, in this second campaign, of course, uh, in the Civil War, it's going to go on to conquer most <laughs> of the Roman Republic. Uh, and uh, apparently uh, Pompey, uh, realizing that he doesn't really have enough forces to fight Caesar, who's got more crack forces, actually fled to Greece uh, at that point. Uh, and um, kind of show this, they have a battle they fight in 48 BC, which was really kind of considered the most pivotal battle really fought uh, in Caesar's civil war. Uh, Caesar, who has not as many forces, part of why Pompey went to Greece was to get more soldiers to fight against, against um, Julius Caesar. And uh, at that point, Caesar's trying to take over Rome. But in August of 48 BC, they fight in Greece, uh, Western Greece, uh, the Battle of Pharsalus, which was fought on August the 9th, 48 BC. And um, Caesar's forces, by the way, they were outnumbered. Caesar had about 25,000 troops, uh, and um, Pompey had 50,000. Actually, had about numbered uh, two to one. But Caesar's forces were just crack forces that had been fighting in Gaul for years. They just crushed uh, Pompey's forces, and half of them didn't want to fight. They surrendered, uh, basically, to Caesar's forces. And so what happened was it forced Pompey to flee. He had to flee to basically uh, what is... Uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, and so he, he was trying to seek refuge from from the Egyptians, uh, from from the Romans, uh, and uh, when he got to uh, Egypt, the Egyptians under uh, King Ptolemy the Fort Fort, actually I think it's uh, that's actually a typo there. I just realized it right there. But Ptolemy the I think it's the thirteenth was the actual uh, ruler uh, at the time. I think fourteen is the brother of. Uh, they, have a, they have a 14 who's the brother of, of Ptolemy, but um, Ptolemy XIII would have him assassinated because uh, he feared that the Romans might come in and conquer Egypt and add it to the Republic. And so he realized he had to do something, and he, so he killed Pompey Paul, Paul at that point. Uh, then what happened next, Caesar then entered Egypt, uh, and uh, he kind of forms this alliance uh, with uh, basically, uh, what is uh, Cleopatra, Queen Cleopatra? And uh, of course, Cleopatra, by the way, at the time, 
was actually co-ruling with her with her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth, uh, who really didn't want her to reign. By the way, uh, and so they end up in a civil war with each other, and Caesar helps Cleopatra get get her throne, like control of Egypt, you know, sole ruler. Uh, after that, and Ptolemy was killed afterwards. Uh, and I think afterwards they had Ptolemy the Fourteenth, who was another brother uh, of uh, the Ptolemies, became the ruler afterwards. Uh, with Cleopatra kind of married married her. It's kind of weird, but Cleopatra actually married her both her brothers, uh, which is kind of the you know Egyptian tradition, you know about that. But um, if you know about it, Caesar and you know one thing that's very famous about Cleopatra. Uh, and Caesar, they became lovers. So see, uh, Cleopatra was kind of like his mistress uh, for a bunch of years uh, until assassination. And they actually would have one son together uh, who was called uh, uh, Caesarian. I think they dubbed him. I think is what they called him or something like that. Uh, and so uh, basically, that's that's basically uh, what what that would be. Actually, I think, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Ptolemy the 14th, I think, is not a brother. Uh, that's actually... I think uh, I think it's a that's a nephew, yeah, a nephew of actually uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth is what it is. So got that wrong. But anyway, um, let me talk about this map right here, though. But um, you can kind of see that ex extent of like Caesar's conquests. By the way, um, you can see that Julius Caesar conquers pretty much most of the area where the Romans are going to control. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea, so you can see, took over Spain, uh, besides Gaul, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Syria, North Africa, all those areas are going to be basically taken by Caesar in these wars against Pompey and his supporters. And uh, Caesar actually summed it up in a famous quote you may have heard of called Veni Vidi Vici, uh, which means I came, I saw, I conquered. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, that quote kind of, kind of sums up, you know, basically how easy uh, the campaigns were uh, of Julius Caesar. And it was actually written in a letter to the Roman Senate uh, to describing his conquests uh, in general. So y'all did this, by the way, at, a, at an age which was closer to like maybe 50 or so uh, when he started all these conquests. So it was much older, you know, compared to like maybe Alexander the Great, who was like in his 20s. Now, what happened, though, afterwards, one thing that occurs, if you know, because he you know, conquers all of basically the Republic at that point, uh, the Senate declares him a dictator uh, of Rome, uh, which I think at first in 40, uh, I think it's 45 BC, uh, he was declared dictator for like 10 years. Uh, and then in uh, 44 BC, they decided to make it for life. Uh, and so that really angered a lot of the optimates uh, in the Roman Senate that didn't like what Julius Caesar was doing. They thought he was going to destroy the traditional republic. Uh, there was even fear that Caesar was going to become a king. I think you start talking about the idea of having a rex uh, and all that. And so that led to a famous conspiracy that formed to kill Caesar, uh, which was they call it the Liberators uh, Conspiracy. And this was like a ring of uh, senators uh, that were kind of more backers of like Pompey, uh, his supporters. Some of them even had been friends with Julius Caesar uh, as well. Uh, and so they plotted to kill Julius Caesar in March of 44 BC. March 15th, you know, uh, is the famous date when the assassination of Julius Caesar happens. They call it the Ides of March, which the Ides of March, by the way, or just Ides, uh, means middle of March, because uh, in the Roman calendar, they usually had a middle date, which is the 15th. And that's one thing about Caesar. He's very famous for reform reforms to Rome, uh, which included like the so-called Julian calendar, uh, which was actually one of the first leap calendars uh, that was developed in the world. And I think it may have been influenced from, from maybe Egyptian ideas. Yeah, that's a very famous painting, by the way, which I think I want to say was done in, like, I want to say the 1800s. Vincenzo Camuccini, I think is his name, he actually made this painting called The Death of Caesar, uh, which shows the actual, you know, deal where uh, the actual senators attack uh, Julius Caesar. 
Uh, I'll kind of talk a little bit about it, but the actual assassination didn't happen in the act actual Senate. It happened in what they call the Theater of Pompey, uh, which was this theater that Gnaeus Pompey had built in, in Rome in the Forum, uh, and they would often meet there. And uh, anyway, he was going into the annex of the actual Theater of Pompey where a bunch of these senators approached him. They were part of the conspiracy. They, I think they approached him with some kind of um, petition to sign at that point. And as he tried to walk away, they grabbed his toga uh, and wouldn't let go of him. Let, let go, let go of him. And Caesar said, "This is violence," or something like that. And they started stabbing him, uh, and uh, they think Caesar was stabbed maybe twenty-three times uh, by the actual conspirators. And um, the two most famous conspirators that were part of the liberators uh, was Gaius Cassius Longinus, and then Marcus Brutus, who, by the way, was an ancestor of the original Brutus. They think uh, that went back to the founding of actual Rome. I think I've got an image showing the actual two uh, right here. So you got Marcus Brutus on the left there in that image. And then they, uh, the other one they call usually Cassius, I think called for short, usually Gaius Cassius Longinus. Uh, so those two are actually sort of two of the main ones that were kind of involved in the actual conspiracy. They say Brutus was the one uh, that stabbed, of course, the last one to stab Caesar. Uh, and um, of course they say that Caesar is opposed, he said to Brutus, at to Brute, and you, Brutus, uh, they say like a question, uh, but they're not sure he really said that or not. That's more like Shakespeare, because Shakespeare later you know, made a play, of course, called Julius Caesar. Uh, but there's a debate about what he said you know, at the end when he got stabbed. I think there's even another theory that he said, uh, you too, my son, or something like that uh, as well. But what ends up happening, the death, the death of Caesar... You can see the aftermath of it. His body right there is kind of laying uh, on the uh, you know floor of the, I guess, where that theater is I'm talking about, theater of Pompey. Uh, and so it just creates chaos in Rome. They have, of course, a funeral afterwards uh, of Caesar. And uh, I'll get to Mark Anthony later. But Mark Anthony, who was one of the generals of Julius Caesar, he gives a great eulogy uh, at, at Caesar's funeral. Well, I think they cremated the body afterwards, which Romans traditionally did. But they think that what's going to happen afterwards, of course, is that it's going to create civil war. Uh, chaos in Rome. Uh, I think they burned down part of Rome uh, after Caesar uh, is killed. Now, I'll get to Octavian. We're going to talk about Octavian. There. Octavian's going to come in. He's a nephew of Julius Caesar, and he's going to take control of, of the Republic. He's going to turn it into, of course, the, the, the Roman Empire that we know of, of course, later. He, of course, is more known by another name you may have heard of called Caesar Augustus, uh, and he'll become the first Roman emperor. So we'll talk about that, though, after, you know, spring break. So I'll kind of get to that later, uh, talk about the Roman Empire, which I think I'll probably have the Roman Empire and at least probably going to take me a three-part series on that later uh, to probably wrap it up, most likely. Uh, before I go today, I did want to remind you about there. There's, by the way, I kind of show you right there. Yeah, there's Oct Octavian, Octavian, Octavius. I think he's called different names. Well, I'll get to him later, of course, Augustus. But um, yeah, reminders don't forget second exam announcement. Of course, I talked about that uh, already, about that. And then, of course, don't forget you've also got the Alexander the Great uh, second exam bonus quiz uh, as well. Uh, to to wrap up, those are things you should be working on right now. Um, you know, we're getting closer to the end of the semester, uh, so um, I know you have like I know another major vocab coming up after spring break. You need to turn in, but I'm not sure if I'm going to have a fourth vocab. I think I'm just going to have. I think I'm deciding only to do three. I think this semester that we'll have, but. Um, You'll have a, like a major final coming up, which the final is going to be on the Roman Empire, I've decided. Uh, and then I'll probably do some kind of uh, final exam bonus quiz, uh, which will be on the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages are probably going to be a recorded lectures, likely. Uh, but I think my Roman Empire lectures after spring break will be my last live stream lectures I'll have for uh, the spring semester 2023. So kind of talking about, you know, some of the things coming up of course, in the semester. By the way, I think Jeremiah, hey, what's going on this morning? Uh, Jeremiah, if you're still watching, 
um, out there. But uh, don't forget, uh, spring break starts April 7th. Don't forget about that uh, on Friday. Uh, so we'll be out, of course, uh, until April 17th, Monday. Uh, that's when, of course, class resume at BRCC. So I did want to remind you about that. So try to get some rest, you know, relaxation, <laughs> you know, during the spring break. I'm going on a trip somewhere, of course. I'll be gone. So, yeah, it might be hard to get me you know, if you can email me or something like that. But I'll probably be, of course, gone for a little bit, little bit of time, you know, uh, during the spring break. So y'all yeah, have a great, great spring break, of course, uh, coming up. Uh, have a good weekend coming up as well. And I'll see you, of course, uh, after after spring break. So everybody take care.